Welcome everyone. We're the Macomb County Genealogy Group and you can find us at our website or Facebook or Pinterest, Twitter, YouTube channel. Um, we've been around for 47 years. Uh, the Let's Talk Me has been around for 15 and we're going virtual for the next year or so. Um, our topic tonight is World War I, Michigan's polar bear soldiers invade Russia and how they lived and survived by Bev Bishop. And if you're new, email us. I'll put that in the chat. Uh, library is starting its renovation. Our stuff is being stored at, uh, with the library and with some of our board members. And so we'll wait to see what happens with the library. Uh, Teresa, do you want to tell them about um, the library's current status? Yes, we are currently uh, working out of the community center in Mount Clemens, which is 300 North Grossbeck. Um, we are open for browsing, um, check out. Uh, we don't have internet connection yet. So we don't have computers up and running for the public. We uh, will we will have a microfilm machine running and have the ability to do some research within the next couple of months, I'm hoping. And uh, so if you have requests, just give us a call or go to the Macomb County Genealogy site and make your request. But we will have some of that ready. But and it's going to be about a year, about a year of being down. Tonight's presenter is Macomb County Genealogy Group's Beverly Bishop. She's got a pharmacist degree from Wayne State University, a doctorate from Midwestern University, Chicago. She's raised in Roseville, but now 41 years in Mount Clemens, and she enjoys a local historical and genealogical groups. Welcome, Bev. You can share your screen. Well, this genealogy group was very inspirational to me because I started going places I never felt uh, comfortable going in terms of looking up my ancestors and how to look critically at pictures you find. And so the first picture slide I'm showing you here is the Reichenbach, my German genealogy. Now I knew they came here in 1830 and then I don't know what happened to them. Because if you see, oh, I'm gonna try out my pointer here, laser pointer. You should all see a little red dot. And here is my grandma. She is the very youngest of a large family. And she and this picture and her wedding picture are all I have. Because when she got a strep infection and died, she ended up, they thought it was infectious. They burnt everything in the house, every piece of paper. Much like we didn't know how COVID spread, they did not know how her infection spread. So we lost almost everything about her. So I'm really focused and I realized, oh my goodness, one of her brothers is wearing a uniform. So why is he wearing a uniform? And who is this wearing the uniform? And I find out that this is Tony and he ends up being a polar bear. And uh, this is his brother, Joe, who ends up being a farmer at Shaner and 23 Mile. And here we have a Detroit policeman. But why was he wearing that uniform? So that's what I needed to explore. So, what I find out is that the United States of America has invaded Archangel Russia in 1918. Most of you went all the way through history class never being told that the US invaded Russia, but in fact, we did. And uh, back in the 1960s, Khrushchev, you might recall him during the Cold War, complained that you Americans have invaded Russia, but I never invaded you. And everyone thought he was kind of a crackpot. But in fact, <laughs> we had we had invaded Russia. We were officially called the American North Russian Expeditionary Forces by President Wilson. The local papers in Detroit said this group was Detroit's own because many came from Detroit, Michigan, or surrounding states. But self-proclaimed when these men came back, they called themselves polar bears. 
So what I'm going to do is run you through a little timeline of what we did. And then I will go back in and fill in the blanks between these, but start up at the very top here. Um, the Great War timeline for the 339th Infantry, the 310th Engineers, and the 337th Medical all came out of Custer and they were all part of the 85th. So they haven't actually been put together yet when the war started in 1914 in Europe. And I, you probably know what started that. I won't waste your time with it. But in 1917, by April 2nd, the U.S. declares war on Germany and they get involved. By 1917, June 5th, there's a mandatory registration for the draft. And using Ancestry.com, I found my, um, my boys, the brothers Joe and Tony Reichenbach. And so I find out later that no, Joe went on to be a farmer and then Tony went in to become a polar bear. So he did get pulled in the draft. But when you went and got your draft card completed, uh, you had to take that receipt back to your employer uh, the next day. Of course, mandatory means you got to do it or you lose your job. And so your employer would know uh, that you had been there or not. And then in, uh, later on in December of that year, they were amassing the people at Camp Custer in Battle Creek, Michigan, and they were planning all along to go to France. Then later on uh, in 1918, February 12th and 13th, they send out a big military exhibition of Detroit's own at the Detroit Armory. And wouldn't you know, um, this was to gain Liberty Bonds and this was to gain support of your men. But Tony hadn't gotten there yet. He didn't get there until he and 78 others left Mount Clemens got on a train and went to Camp Custer on May 24th. So all of this can be documented. And then later on, guess what? They don't go to France. They are told as they're leaving on July 14th that you're going to hop over to Canada, then New Jersey, Long Island, and then take a convoy to Liverpool, England, where you will spend a month getting retrained so you can go to the Arctic Circle. I'm sure everybody was excited to go to the Arctic Circle instead of France, where all the excitement was, to tell you the truth. So what's going on back in Detroit? Well, German loyalty is truly being tested and um, everything is happening. Right in the very middle of this one slide, I want you to see this man. He is Albert Kaltschmidt. He is the ringleader of a spy group who is centered in Detroit and working in concert with the Germany ambassador in Washington, DC, trading secrets about how not only the United States is getting ready for war, but also Canada. So across from us in Detroit, in Canada, was a building that was used for allied war work. And it just happened to explode at that time. And he was the culprit. And so you can see the FBI has his hand on his arm and the other FBI man, I think he's covering up a gun and they are taking him to prison where he spent the rest of the war, Mr. Kaltschmidt. And the Germany um, ambassador, Count von Bernstorff was told to leave Washington DC immediately. And he was sent out of the country by Woodrow Wilson. So what else was going on was that our Henry Ford local man, he was a big celebrity at the time, and he really wanted to have peace. He was greatly a pacifist. So he got this ship called the Friendship, and they were going to go off to Europe and convince the heads of state that we should not even have a war. So he got 150 activists to get on board to broker this peace. And wouldn't you know it? As he gets there, he comes down with a really bad case of the Spanish influenza and cannot get off the ship. So Jane Adams continues to talk about peace and she leaves the ship and tries to do what she can. But you know, really our calling card to the heads of state was Henry Ford, not Jane Adams. And so they were sent back home and they continued to push 
to stay out of the war until we started the war. And then they were pretty much gagged uh, by the US government to be quiet and join. And basically um, they took his yacht, his hospital, uh, Henry Ford kind of paid for that. Now here's the picture that was a very famous postcard in the extreme center, you see Woodrow Wilson, he is addressing um, the House of Representatives and the Senate, and they are voting to not only go to war, but to have the first mandatory draft. That was a big deal. I mean, I've been through Vietnam, but like this was, that was a draft. And now this one was the very first one. You could draft people, horses, ships, hospitals, almost anything you needed for the war effort. And so um, this postcard is very famous. It's in a lot of uh, antique shops even today. And of course, we couldn't have a war without sort of a, a calling man. And here is our, our man. Here's Uncle Sam, and he wants you. And it's a colorful lithograph. It was actually a new form of lithographs and all of the posters in World War I were pretty much done with these multi-colors and bright colors. And they literally plastered cities. Like Mount Clemens had them on poles, on buildings, inside of shops. And much more than just this one. I could do a talk just on the posters. But this man, Uncle Sam, he says all males, all males between the ages of 21 and 30 must personally appear at a place in the election district on Tuesday, June 5th to register. No excuse for failure will be accepted. So that's what needed to be done. Then there were two more drafts. About a year later, they were drafting and um, sometime a few months after that. And they extended the draft all the way to 18 to 45 year olds, mostly to see where the workforce was that was left back here. So this was a beautiful um, art piece. And the artist is James Montgomery. He had been working for newspapers and, and doing a lot of art. But in 1917, he met a man called George Creel. And now is where I would ask you, do you know George? George is the one for all the propaganda that went out to raise the flag for World War I and send your money for Liberty Bonds. He promoted it. And I'm telling you, everybody got caught up in the excitement of war. I can show you that Walt Disney over here, this is Walt. Now, while he did a lot of cartoons and he gave tours, he did contract the influenza and he did make, meet Ray Kroc, who started McDonald's. Look at this. He's got an art piece right on the back of his ambulance wagon. And he was 16 years old. Also, Ernest Hemingway had to go to it too, although he was in Italy. And after two months, he was really devastatingly wounded. Uh, very badly, and it affected his life thereafter, the rawness that he wrote with, and, uh, and a lot of sadness. He had a, a, a trouble sleeping. It was a very tough war for him, but he saw it in Italy. And then here is Canada, the women's new roles. The, this is a posed picture of the drivers, and especially ambulance drivers. They utilize the women for that role. Gertrude Steen, Stein was already wealthy and she was living in France. Uh, you may have heard of her in the art world. And she actually drove her own ambulance. And uh, Amelia Earhart also was involved with driving ambulances. And I, I didn't know that at all. I'd like to know who would have known that. And she worked for the VAD. Now the VAD was the Voluntary Aid Detachment. She happened to be visiting a younger sister at the time. She saw wounded soldiers coming back to Toronto and she just wanted to help. So she saw airplanes taking off and she went and she got the flu. Now let's go back home to Camp Custer. The excitement has built for World War I and these are the young men, some of them that were in training in Battle Creek, and I would like you to take note of their hats, because these hats were left in England and they were given new ones. 
This is one of the brochures from the military exhibition. And if you notice that, like I said before, it was in February of 1917. And if I say 2017 or something like that, you know that I am only talking about 1900s because it's hard to keep that one at the tip of your brain. So, okay, all the proceeds were going to go to the company and you could buy this program for 10 cents. And so after this, 78 more recruits report on May 24th, like I said before, oh, this is 2018, I, I mean, 1918, I'm sorry about that. And this particular shipment of men coming from Mount Clemens included my great uncle, Tony or Anthony Reichenbach, Frank Tarnowski, Harold Green, Jesse Parrott, and Clement Grobel. And we do have Mike Grobel on the call today. I've already said hello to him and that would be his grandfather. So all these folks may have been late to the table, but they got on the ship to get to Russia. So one other thing is that Tony, they all did make it back except Jesse. Jesse Parrott did die of influenza, the Spanish flu, and uh, Frank Tarnowski, he's my find. I was so excited. When I got involved in this, I started looking at headstones to see if anyone got mentioned as a World War I or World War II um, participant. And I found his over in Roseville at the Sacred Heart Church Cemetery. And I said, whoa, there's another one. So there is a large uh, listing of these men and a lot of data about them kept at the Bentley Museum at U of M. And uh, his name was added there because I found it. So I was pretty excited about that. You know, there wasn't a lot of good record keeping in terms of the people in charge of wars, but the people who went to war did all kinds of writing and diaries and letters home that we can track. So that makes it exciting. And so again, another quick timeline is that um, they got to England in 1918 in August and they were, they, they had to give up their clothes, they had to trade in their guns, they got all new outfits to go and be a part of the British group, which was really odd to me because Pershing, the general that handled this whole war uh, from the United States, Pershing said no one would command my men but me. And in fact, uh, these men were pretty much given up to the control of, of another country. And then in September, um, they did arrive in Archangel and they had to bill it because they had no place to stay. And they were told, as long as we're gonna tell you you're going to Russia, we might as well let you know too. This is a guarding exposition uh, and you'll just have to guard all of the supplies that belong to the allies. And that'll be how it is. But in fact, they got there and pretty much it had already been taken. There was a civil war going on and the Bolsheviks had already grabbed all of the allied supplies. So then it was kind of a, a, a changing war. We're not gonna guard it, we're gonna go retrieve it. So um, I've heard people call this the creep, war creep, where you didn't expect to do it, but you did it. Okay, on December 30th of that year, my relative Tony is injured among 30 or 20 others in Siletsko. And um, he gets the wound chevron to put on his uniform because of that. And then as time goes on, um, we have already had the armistice. The armistice was signed, but Detroit's own, we're told, <clears throat> your situation does not change we are still fighting the Bolsheviks. We are still trying to get our stuff back. We're still holding ground. We're still trying to preserve the railroads. So what happens, this is so um, iconic, on no, the 11th month, November, on the 11th day at 11 a.m., the armistice is signed, but that just doesn't apply. Did they know it? Yes, they knew it, but we still have the bloodiest battle to follow that. It was either that day or the next. And uh, that was a, a tough pill to swallow for them. So it takes them from then in November to the following June. 
and a huge petition drive to get them to come home and leave Archangel. And then finally, they do arrive in Belle Isle. And that'll be the end of my talk when I show you all the wonderful, happy pictures of when they actually come and how iconic that they come home and get celebrated on the 4th of July. So now you see the whole timeline. Let's see how it plays out. Well, first of all, they have to get some uniforms to go there. They're going to the Arctic Circle, for goodness sake. And so who do you call? You call the expert, Sir Ernest Shackleton and they get Shackleton kits. Now this man was an Arctic explorer, a British hero, and he was the advisor for the Russian expedition. And that would have been fine if the guys had sleighs, like look at this sideways sleigh with the nice uh, runners there. That isn't exactly what they got when they got to Archangel and they didn't get horses and things like that. Uh oh, how do I get the next slide? Next. Okay, so here's the Shackleton kit. And it's got these boots that are just awful. They're very slippery and they don't walk well in snow. And if you're trying to run from the enemy or run at the enemy, these are not the boots to do it in. You will just fall. And also they had heavy coats, as you can see in this picture over here that just flapped around. And again, we're not good fighting things. If you were sitting on a horse and you wanted to stay warm, these are great, but not for fighting. So what they did was they complained about this and it was in their newspapers. And surprisingly, um, they complained about it when they got home till the 1930s, they could not believe what they were sent with. It was causing you to have worse than a Charlie Chaplin walk. It caused a shuffle hip screwing, which means you shuffle your hip forward and you screw sideways. And if you can imagine yourself willing your body forward on these boots, and they noticed, these are young men, they noticed the ladies in Archangel, and they even quote, the fair Barishna held her furs up to conceal a laugh at them. Oh dear, they're being laughed at by the locals. And there's a sh shimmy and cheek dance. I did not make any of this up. So where are they at? They are in Archangel and this is the map. You see Sweden and Norway, you see Finland, and then you see the Arctic Ocean is all these dots, that's the water. And so they've got to come down and into this peninsula where Archangel is. Well, that's a problem because it's going to freeze right up and you're not gonna get in or out and you're not gonna get much foodstuffs coming in either. Now, Archangel originally hundreds of years ago was quite a hub, but the goal was to not allow Archangel to stockpile foods and things because coming down the railroad, they wanted the hub to be St. Petersburg and Moscow. And Vologda is the center of the whole Trans-Siberian Railroad taking you in and out. So this was the extreme transportation and it needed to be guarded from this civil disruption going on in Russia. It was so important. So um, my soldier, Tony, ended up being in a war over here in Coltless. And uh, that was also Soletsko, which was close to it. But if you notice, it would have been convenient to stay in Archangel and just keep the supplies there, but they literally had to go hundreds of miles to try and preserve or to get back what they had. So if you were, you know, close to Archangel, you probably had a good time. Like, you know, people in charge and the engineers. But if you're one of the soldiers going out to get things, it was not easy. When they got there, the US Army Signal Corps had photographers. They could do movies and they could do stills and they could do inside and outside. And they were given a driver and a nice car. And they were looking around saying, this is a gorgeous place. Look at these little onion caps on the churches and the beautiful buildings. 
And here's a church they took a picture of an archangel. So the good part is that I've got pictures to show you, which I'm really excited about. And here they are. Okay, arrival and setup. Here's the ambulance group coming in off the ship. And these are the World War I ambulances and they had people to drive them. They could set up their engineering photo dark room here and they had a place to develop their pictures. And the 310th engineers headquarters was pretty nice. They got actual headquarters. And here was a nice picture of the Troitsky Prospect, which I guess is a road, and it has a nice little trolley car down here. So Archangel is quite, um, you know, a settled city with a lot of amenities for its time, if you could stay there. They also set up the Red Cross and the YMCA, and here's a Canadian flag. And we were there, not just the Americans, which there were about 5,000 Americans, but also uh, the Canadians, there were a few Australians, there were uh, French, uh, quite a number of allies were there. And here they are doing, um, this says photographer at work, or I don't know if they were doing map making and topographical surveys, uh, that's what it looks like to me. And then this is a sawmill. Our men got there and there really wasn't a place to have barracks. So they were luckily, um, you know, you can imagine, I mean, my grandparents and great grandparents owned farms, they knew what sawmills were, they knew how to work sawmills, and they knew how to hunt and they knew how to fish. So all of these skills came into play from the Michigan men and um, thank heavens because they had nothing they had to take over a sawmill and do it. I understand they even had to make uh, some of the sawmills and get their own uh, building materials ready to go to make their shelters. And here are some engineers at their desk. Only a couple are smiling and they must be the ones that don't mind cold. And nicely on these pictures, their name appears and who they were with, the 310th engineers. So this was kind of exciting. You can see they got nice lamps, nice desks. They have all the amenities. Good place to be inside. And what would you go looking at? Well, if you were a sightseer or you wanted to take some photographs, what you could find were museums, believe it or not. And here is Peter the Great's carriage and his log house. How cool. Now, I cannot verify that this is still there. I believe that during the whole communist regime, they wanted to obliterate the history especially of people who had been in charge. Of course, you know, at the beginning of this, their um, czar stepped down, advocated or left it in some way, and uh, they didn't want anything to do with that. And here is all of Archangel with a beautiful um, area of water right over the, the ridge of all the buildings. And there's a little park right here I'm pointing out on, on Troitsky Prospect. And that statue you see in the middle of it is of Peter the Great. And I don't believe that stands there any longer either because it's easier to get rid of history and not think about it than leave it, I guess. So that's uh, what you would see as a sightseer. And then how did they... Uh, live. Well, they right away took pictures of headquarter living space, which is quite lovely. They have decorated with pictures. They have curtains. They have a place to put your records. They have a phonograph on top. They have benches to sit at and your table has tablecloths and it's made up. This one has a soup terrain, a lovely lighting fixture a water um, canter decanter here. And these are the officer's quarters. And then this is the detached quarters that you would sleep in. So they have their beds that look like little oblong things and their clothing is hung up and then it's covered with an extra piece of cloth. They also could sit at a table on a bench by the fireplace, lovely. And this is where the tire meets the road. 
our men are now standing out here being spoken to by the Allied troops, in particular, General Eugene Miller of the White Russian Army telling our troops what to do. I, I guess Pershing was okay with this. I didn't hear anything. And uh, he was in charge. Of course, the white Russians were the actual government that we were trying to bolster up. And the red Russians are the Bolsheviks that we are fighting. And here's what the enlisted men look like. Here's their barracks, not near as wonderful, no pictures or curtains on the walls. And they are applying sawdust for insulation here, it looks like. And they are keeping it together. They've got hats on and they are building their barracks, the Michigan barracks, this one is called. And here is a whole series of Michigan barracks that they built. And we get an inside picture here of some young men that were serving and they're kind of proud. You know, you see kind of a little look in their eye, their cigarettes hanging out of the mouth, their corn cob pipes that were popular, their writing materials, which were so common in the day to write uh, their diary, to send letters home. And of course, the alcohol that was made available. And this gentleman too has a bottle in his hand. So there they are, they got their picture taken. Very young men. And so here are some block houses. Here is a block house in Kodish, Kodish in the front. And I do think that my relative would have seen this because this is where he was uh, at a, a battle in uh, Kodish and Siletsko. And this is yet another picture of it. This is a way that they had built in Tulgas. I think that's spelled wrong there. And this is a standard eight-man block house that was built out of wood. And they did try and stay warm. And these block houses were built all along the railroad because they needed to preserve the railroad. The one thing you want to do if you're at war with someone is break up their communication and their modes of transportation. So, of course, you know, the Bolsheviks were trying to uh, destroy the railroad all along it and snipers to kill people. And this is a concrete black house. I, I can't imagine we would have built that. I, it was too darn cold by the time we got there or our men got there. So that's um, some pictures. Now the battlefield. I cannot tell it any better than this man tells it. The snow is piled hip to shoulder high. The wind is blowing rawly. The temperature is minus 45 degrees Fahrenheit. 47 US soldiers are fighting 800 white clad Bolsheviks down a ravine and up a hill. Only seven survive, taking seven days and nights to get back to Archangel. All the time surrounded by snipers. Now, this, this is the devastatingly uh, raw conditions that they fought in. Harry Meade wrote this on January 19th, 1919. And then to get back to a quick timeline, uh, there is a Davina River railhead that was very important. Remember Davina River, uh, there's a lot that was going on with that. And um, of course, I just wanted to point out here that we had 4,500 soldiers or approximately 5,000. They were supposed to guard this stuff from the Bolos. And here they are in Tolgas, 200 miles away on Armistice Day, getting blasted. And over here in January was that 40 of 47 who died. And the Allies are definitely defeated. And here is Siletsko that I've been talking about. And that's 100 miles away from um, uh, south of Archangel. And these railroads go for 400 miles. And they're getting hit constantly. Their rolling stock is taken. Their skirmishes, their snipers, etc. 
Now, how did they get around and what transportation did they use for all this I was just talking about? Well, they had little sleds and they had little ponies that would pull them and they had the locals that would help them. And at one point when they had to evacuate a hospital, these locals helped them a great deal by carrying the wounded out. And they didn't necessarily in these small getups have to go on regular roads. They knew their way through the forest so they could avoid um, the enemy. And here you go, here is a local man. And they were smaller in stature than our men. And our men averaged five foot four. They were just a smaller size back then. And I think our average now is like 5'10". And um, so five foot four when you look at their draft uh, cards. And here they had, uh, the engineers had motor transportation and they could move out with that. And there were dances. What did they do in their time off? They went to dances. The ladies held them from the Red Cross. They did celebrate Christmas and they did get stockings with candy. They took the drafting room and decorated it big so they could have a party and they did Christmas. Holiday dances were a big deal and anybody convalescing in the hospitals uh, could obviously go to these, but if you were hundred miles away, unlikely. The Russian people, um, from what I've read, there were a couple of names for them, but uh, I'll just take the Majiks, Mujiks. And here they are carrying water in Archangel. Now you have to remember there were the haves and the have nots. And these were the have nots. Here is a couple that is sawing logs for themselves. So women worked hard, women worked very hard carrying water. And of course the whole family worked to plow. You know, Henry Ford was trying to perfect a tractor to replace this plowing. And he especially had Russia in mind for the sales uh, during World War I. And that's a very interesting talk of its own. Food, food, food. I mean, we eat three times a day, hello, we want food. Well, our men uh, actually couldn't get enough from the trains. Look at they're waiting to get whatever they can and haul it back uh, to wherever they are uh, so that they can eat. And then also they would have to supplement that by going to the Russian markets. So this would be a market you bring your trunk, lay it down and sell what you've got. It was quite meager. And over here, you can see the market scene where you are buying what they call beef, although it could have been reindeer, uh, by the pound. And up here, you see the engineer's supply depot. And I'm assuming that they had some food in there. But the thing is, if you couldn't get food where you were at, you would have to do your own hunting and fishing. You would have to shoot a rabbit or a bird or something uh, to cook for yourselves. It wasn't hand given to our men that were out fighting. <clears throat> and we had quite a struggle <clears throat> because the Majuks were the have not. They were not very wealthy and um, they shared what they had with the US soldiers. And in turn, we shared what we had or the, the allied soldiers did by giving the children food. They were very hungry, they were starving, they had little enough to keep them going through the harsh existence that they lived in. But you can see here that one of the Russian ladies became a bride. <coughs> Excuse me. She's almost taller than he is, which was kind of interesting, but everyone dressed up for it. And here is one of the homes where our people were billeted and they are making um, cloth and, and making things on their hand looms. Now in terms of food, don't forget that the rich people, especially the ones that were in Archangel, were the haves. They were the aristocrats. They had many servants. They had governesses. But they didn't have food when the food couldn't get to them because of this war. There's a story of one of their daughters being asked to swim across the river with two silver spoons and try and trade with the Mujiks for food. And so she does this and she encounters a woman and says, will you take my spoons? 
And the woman says, well, yeah, I would like some silver spoons in my household. Uh, I'll give you a few potatoes. So it really was a leveling of the classes. And that is part of what communism was trying to achieve. What about communication? <clears throat> the American Sentinel came out with 25 uh, um, supplements that came out. There were 25 of them. This happens to be number 25. And it is the last one that was done Memorial Day as they were getting ready to leave in June. So this is the very last one. If you would like to see the other ones, one through 24, they are at the Bentley Museum at U of M. But what did they learn? They had a printing press, they had their paper. They would learn about war news from around the world. They would learn about ANREF headquarters, what was going on in the different battles because they weren't all at every battle. And President Wilson happened to be in Carlisle, England. Prohibition laws were headlines in the US. Henry Ford loses a Senate race. They also had a poetry column and they had art supplies that were free if you ran down to the Red Cross. And they find out that Theodore Roosevelt has died suddenly on January 7th. So what else were they doing? They were manning the fire lanes and the train tracks. And these are the men repairing the train tracks. And these are the um, clearing a fire lane. They have a little dog there and making sure they had guns in case they were fired upon and girding their train from destruction. How did they do their laundry? Well, if you did it like the locals did it, you put it on this sleigh. Now you put all your laundry in this pot and it had already been warmed and soaked up. You take it out to the river, cut yourself a hole and stick the laundry down in to rinse all the soap out, wring it out and bring it back in your basket. Now that's what our men could do, or they could just come down here. These, this is an actual shot of them boiling their socks and they are getting ready um, for laundry day. And they could boil their socks after they had slogged through knee deep swamps for miles and then either put them inside or hang them over a fire to dry. Pretty Monday, <laughs> not so easy. Okay, now this, this is a hard part. This is um, really uh, a tough thing to bear here. This is the stats. There were 235 of the polar bears that died while serving. This include 152 that were killed in action the remaining soldiers died from pneumonia, accidents, influenza, and one from suicide. Also, more than 300 were wounded. So on May 30th, there was a Memorial Day parade, and this is the parade. They went through the streets of uh, Archangel, and then they had a service. You can see the dignitaries up here on the DS, and they're giving their speeches and they are getting ready uh, at the cemetery uh, to, to give their final goodbyes to those that they are leaving buried. Now they tried to bring as many as they could back, but they could not bring everything. They couldn't bring everybody. So then they also knew that they had burials that had occurred out in the battlefield and they couldn't bring home those folks. And they did thrive on humor. In a lot of their, their um, publications, they talked about funny things and they shared them across the other war fronts. So this is actually a trench and we didn't have trenches in uh, the Arctic, but this is a trench and here it is with, you know, booms and bangs and missiles and fighting. And they're down here in the trenches, sitting on a box in the mud, and they're reading about a peace conference. Really? I don't feel like it's a peace conference. And then they say, well, heck, might look bad here, but well, Bill, we certainly got a job after the war, so it looks good. Anyways, and that was their attempt at humor. And they could 
um, identify it. They had grit and gumption and good humor to get through all this. And here's a painting. Um, this is a painting that depicts Sergeant Mike Burke's machine gun squad of Company G. And he is fighting here. He is firing a Lewis machine gun. You see it right here? And the soldier on his right is preparing to provide reloads. So this man, he looks like he's not doing anything with his gun sticking up, but he's he's got a job. He's supposed to reload it. He is the painter, and he did this by memory once he'd gotten home. He is Corporal John Tornman. And then there's a Private Lewis Stark that is wounded in the forearm. So he is forever immortalized. And at the bottom of the painting are the two soldiers who died and were buried close by there. You can see the two of them. So they were eventually brought back and they do now rest. It is Private J. Pitts and Private Clarence Mom. They reside at the White Chapel Memorial Park Cemetery in Troy, Michigan. While we're on the subject of art, I wanted to bring up Roy Gamble. Roy Gamble didn't appear in Russia. He, on the other hand, went to France and he went with the Macomb County Hospital. It was number 36 and he was in good company with many names you might recognize. But what he did, he came home and they said, you're a muralist, do something for our boys who went to war from the Central High School. And the very last name that got put on there was a polar bear. So only one from this high school and his name was Lewis Witt. So this is the statue that is at Whitechapel Cemetery. And it was dedicated on some years after the men came home. Almost, well, it was 10 years after. So on Memorial Day in 1930, there was a very impressive ceremony that the top, uh, you know, government dignitaries and state and city, everybody came and they buried 41 men that they had brought home from the 339th Infantry and the other two um, military groups. And so then after that, they did bring more. But to start with, they had 41. They were laid to rest as part of the polar bear uh, group who had made the supreme sacrifice in the far off tundra. And this famed memorial is created by the French sculptor Leon Harmont. That's his name. He carved it from a solid block of white Georgian marble. It is a historic site for the state of Michigan. And they host a Memorial Day ceremony every Memorial Day. When I found out about this, I started going, but I only got to a couple of them before COVID hit and I couldn't go last year. And so it starts at 11 a.m., the iconic time of the armistice. It's just a very uh, poignant time. Be there at 11. On the other end of Royal Oak is the Detroit Zoo. So I was very surprised when I came across this particular plaque. And oh my goodness, uh, it is the polar bears plaque dedication that was held in 2001, right at the Arctic Ring of Life exhibit. And if you'll notice, that is Stan Bozich with the hat on. And here's one of the real polar bears. And he has done so much work to bring military, Michigan military to the forefront that gosh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, he started the military museum that you will find in um, Frankenmuth. And I went there when he first started it and I just thought it was an empty hall. And then I went several more times and found how much polar bear stuff had been given to him as the repository. Now he worked for the big three automakers and he did this as a labor of love. He would go up there every weekend and work harder and harder at it. Now we have lost Stan Bozich, but I understand his son 
uh, handles the museum and, and other people do today. And uh, and basically, they've got a big polar bear when you first walk in, and it's just been an amazing thing. So we also have that. I, I don't know if any of you have seen this plaque. Now is when I'd like to ask you. <laughs> that is the plaque, and it describes Detroit's own the polar bears. So that's where they get their recognition. Okay. So I was just filling in the timeline for you. And here is the welcome home at Belle Isle. And this particular one is the mama saying, we're glad you're home. It's the big crowds that came with their straw hats. It's some leftover folks from other wars like the Civil War. And of course they were very happy folks. They got this armband to put on. Now, actually some of these have survived. They were just paper and it was their entry ticket for free food, free lodging, free beer all day long. So they were treated. And then the 10 years later, as I showed you the polar bear, they brought home the bodies. And these were the family members coming to view the remains, not the boxes, the caskets. They were covered in flags. You could walk down the center of this building and then they were laid out. Do you see them here? They're all laid out and they're going to be buried all around the polar bear. He is watching out for them now. And on that day, there was 55 hearses that came down all the way down to the cemetery. Now, my relative knew this was going to happen, but he did not survive at home. After his injuries, his flu, I, I believe he came home with TB and he ended up dying within 10 years. So he died before this occurred in 1930. So now I've taken you full circle. I've shown you the picture of the whole family. The man who got me interested in this, Tony, Tony gets home and he marries Veronica Geetson. And so his younger sister, Amelia, gets married and she is my grandma. So I have gotten to know at least this much of my family genealogy. And there are other people that came up in this story too. And I just wanna tell you this last one, the story about the spoons. She was to give the silver spoons for food is this young woman. And her name is Eugenie Fraser, Fraser. She wrote The House by the Divinia River, a Russian childhood. So she was the rich girl. And as things got worse and worse and worse for her, her, um, her, her mother was from Scotland and took the family back to Scotland. So she wrote the book and it published in 84, 1984. By 1990, the people of Archangel, all expenses paid trip was offered to Eugenie to come and tell her side of the story. Because everything had been obliterated, they didn't know the story of the war. They didn't know what was there before or in the middle. But all they knew was communism afterward. So they brought her in for History Remembered. And there's an hour long video on YouTube that describes what her actually telling them that over food and getting excited and, and telling her side of the story. So the surprising part is all this happened at Archangel and they don't even know it. They don't know as much as you know at this point. So that is the end of my presentation. Here's a golfer from the era, another long lost relative. He's a new story. So let's go golfing. So that is actually the end of my presentation. I thank you so much for your attention uh, tonight. And I welcome any comments you might have about this particular um, topic. So thank you. Thank you, Bev. That was great. Um, I okay. don't have any comments in chat at the moment because I think because I forgot to explain how to find the chat. So if you have any questions and you have a microphone, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. If you don't have a microphone, if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen with your mouse or your trackpad, there's a uh, icon in the middle called chat with a uh, talking comic bubble. Click that and then um, type your uh, question into the chat and I will ask Bev for you.
Does anyone have a question for Beth? Lisa, I do. Sure, go ahead, Sharon. This is Karen Geyer, I got knocked off of chat. Um, <laughs> this was a wonderful presentation. And how is it that you that you got interested, and maybe you said this at the beginning, but you got interested in the picture with the uh, the military uniform, and how did you get the picture uh, from someone else, or was it one you had and you just started looking? And did you did you find a lot in terms of the military records at that point? My grandfather was in that age group, and I'm thinking now I've never checked that. Oh, oh yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, you can Great. turn your uh, video back on, Bev, if you desire. If I could find it, I would. <laughs> Uh, cl uh, close out of your presentation and then close bring it. them back to the front and then uh, scroll down to the on the screen and then over in the lower left you'll find start video yes thank you so much gosh you're wonderful okay um, I got real interested because uh, my grandmother got a strep infection and she died when she was 29 so I never met her and um, she left the four-year-old mom and uh, that was the only picture I had until I could find her wedding picture. And as you're trying to get into genealogy, uh, this whole group kind of goads you on to keep looking for pictures. And, you know, they didn't write on them. You had to date them by looking at what was going on in the picture. Now, I believe that that picture I found was my uncle's wedding picture because he looks the same. So if the family's getting, you know, together for a wedding, wasn't it common to then take a, a big family picture. And maybe they took other couples too, but I didn't find any of those. And again, most everything was destroyed because she had something called erysipelas, which was a staph and strep infection. Today, we would treat it in a New York minute. You know, you wouldn't have to go to the hospital. So um, that's how I found that picture and that curiosity about who is this guy. And then I, I just started, you know, it's funny, but when, when the student is ready to learn, the teachers pop up everywhere. And I realized that that, that military museum in a Frankenmuth and the military museum that we have on Nine Mile and Gratiot, it has an enormous amount of great stuff that you can find that might relate to your family. And they have databases there, but they're not online, but you have to go there and they can look it up and tell you if any of your family is involved in their databases. And, um, you know, if you just find a trunk of great stuff, these military museums will take it. I often go to Cadillac, Michigan, and I found that 12 miles above Cadillac in Manton, they have a great military museum. And oh my gosh, someone found an entire trunk of polar bear artifacts in their house when a guy, old guy dies. And so give this to the museum and oh my gosh, they stuffed it into a little, a, a little display. And I said, open that up. I got to see it all, you know? So they laid it all out. And he also had saved his armband from the city of Detroit when they came back. That family had everything. It was just amazing. But now we can all enjoy it. We can all figure out that our family probably had it too. You know, not everybody saved it. So um, these things are popping up even now in Michigan. Uh, lots of good stuff. So that's, that's how I got. Thank you, Sharon, for asking. Uh, thank you. It's wonderful presentations in the chat. Um, anyone else have a question they'd like to uh, ask? Just turn your microphone on and uh, ask Mike, away. Mike Grobel here. <clears throat> Hi, Mike. Uh, if I could, I just would uh, like to second that uh, uh, idea about the book, The Little House on the Divinia. That's a very good book to read to get a feel for what the situation was uh, prior to the war in Archangel. The lifestyle, as well as then the hardships they, they endured during uh, the Allied intervention. Uh, very, very good uh, background for that. Uh, I'd also like to add the comment, though, that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I had the chance to go to Archangel back in 2018. So um, one of the people I met with was the local history professor. And uh, through an interpreter, we uh, discussed certain things, but she was a quite stern type. I was warned about that in advance. Uh, she would meet with me, but I needed to bring some questions. Uh, so I did, and she elaborated by beginning uh, the discussion. I, we remember that uh, the Americans arrived 
and uh, their discipline wasn't very good, like the, unlike the British. Uh, the British forbade their men to uh, fraternize with the locals. But she said the Americans didn't take that as seriously, and as a result, the venereal disease rate spiked when the Americans arrived. Okay, silence. You know, I just nod my head, and then the next one comes. And then you brought the Spanish influenza virus with you, which decimated our villages and communities. And so, you know, what, what do I say? You know, I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then she added in a slight smile, she says, but unlike the British or the French, the Americans fed our children, the street orphans. And, and we remember that. Thanks, Mike. I, I am so jealous that you went there and actually walked where some of these battles were. And I understand, I saw pictures of you over there, and I guess you actually uh, picked up bullets and things. Were you able to bring any of that home? Uh, I was able to bring uh, certain things home, uh, uh, shards of uh, shrapnel and that. I uh, tried to bring a few uh, empty shell case or uh, bullet casings, but they got confiscated at the airport, even though there was no bullet in them. Uh, the primer was still in there and they wouldn't let me bring that back. And those were unusual because you could tell they had been hit with an ax. There was a, a sharp crease in the brass casing. And my friend up there, Alexi, explained uh, the men would hit the casing with the ax, dislodge the bullet, and then take the gunpowder out and dump it on their f fire to get their campfire going. Uh -huh. So when you find these, these are kind of rare. So I tried bringing a couple of those back, but they still had the primer on them. So they didn't make it through customs. I made it through the first x-ray, but not the second one. Uh, a gentleman in a big hat, military hat, came up to me while I'm waiting to board and asked, are you Mr. Grobel? Yes, I am. Follow me. <laughs> I had to go down and take that out of my luggage and uh, uh, hand it over to another lady with an e even uh, equally impressive military uniform. And, she says, uh, we do not permit those on our planes. <laughs> I said, well, that's fine with me. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the nicest words, though, were the next ones when she says, you're free to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I know that your dad or your grandfather's things, Clement Grobel is your grandfather, if I got right. that right. Right. His stuff was on display when I was up in Frankenmuth, and I called it the Military Museum, but I think they've rechanged their name to the Heroes Museum. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, it's uh, the Michigan Heroes Museum. It's a name change, actually, to make it a little shorter and easier to remember because we're doing uh, radio advertising and other types of advertising and uh, to distinguish ourselves a little better. I'm on the board of directors. Oh. Uh, Stanley Bozich, who you mentioned, uh, he knew many of the polar bear veterans back in the 1970s and helped them organize their every other year reunions because uh, some of them couldn't drive anymore and things like that. So he got to know them. They made him an honorary member of the Polar Bear Association in 1980. And as a result, as a result of those contacts, uh, a lot of the polar bears, since their family members didn't want their old uniforms and stuff, they would give them to Stan. So that's how he began his collection of polar bear um, uh, stuff back in the 70s. And currently the museum has uh, what we call stories, which are uh, consist of a uniform, medals, and a photo at a minimum. So we've got about almost 50 of those from uh, various polar bears throughout the state of Michigan in our collection. Typically, we've only got room to display about a dozen of them at a time. My grandfather's is one of them. Uh, he's, his display, though, is located over in the Cross Gallery because he was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. So uh, we've got two Distinguished Cross Distinguished Service Cross Polar Bear Veterans on display, my grandfather, and also Matt Grayick. Now, again, I, I'm not real good on military, but that that is something about the French, and that is uh, de Gour? Okay, uh, my grandfather was awarded two medals. He was awarded the French Croix de Guerre because on the day of that particular battle, uh, the uh, officer in charge was a, a French uh, lieutenant colonel. So... Uh, he immediately was awarded that uh, a month or two later as a result of having been written up in the after action report. So that's how he got the Croix de Guerre. And then uh, a couple of years later, uh, after going through all the records and everything, he uh, also got the, uh, the uh, Distinguished Service Cross. 
uh, that was sent to him. That's the second highest military honor we have, uh, just below that of the Medal of Honor. Speaking wow. of which, the Michigan Heroes Museum has the stories of uh, 30 Michigan um, recipients of the Medal of Honor. So uh, we've got the largest display you'll find anywhere is with the original uh, engraved, signed Medals of Honors and the stories of those individuals. Uh, you won't find that large a collection anywhere. It's not even in the, in the um, National Medal of Honor uh, Society's museum. So and they're all from Michigan. Wow. Well, I hope uh, that you guys are endeavoring on a new building because last time I saw it, it was pretty stuffed. I, I could hardly get away. You know, I just, there's so much to see. It's just the most wonderful museum. So I hope everybody uh, gets up there and takes a look. Are you thinking of a new building? We have artist renderings and uh, such, but uh, right now that's a little bit beyond our budget. And uh, COVID certainly, uh, you know, threw us for a loop here, but we've managed to, uh, to, to pull through that uh, with the help of some PPP loans, because uh, we do have some paid staff. So, uh, you know, we, we, all, we almost recovered in September. You know, we were back almost even with the previous year, and then uh, the bottom fell out in October and November. So uh, things will be better this year. Very good, very good. Now your, your family was from Centerline, is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and my uncle that I kept talking about uh, was from Centerline and he ended up being buried at the St. Clement. St. Clement Cemetery, yep. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple other polar bears buried there as well. Not my grandfather, he's down at Mount Olivet, but Anthony Balbier is buried at St. Clement's, I know that. Um, and he, he your, your uncle, great uncle he lived uh in the what nine and van dyke area was it yes closer to yeah. that area yeah, yeah. so um, i've I, been over there to take a look at that and they are trying to preserve that cemetery i'm very glad of that too people just give their time and um there was a man working there and he ended up being my third cousin and he was showing me where the Reichenbach stuff was and and uh they are trying to avoid all the water apparently a lot of these cemeteries have huge water flow into them and they need to be raised up all the time and their roads, but no one wants to pay for those kinds of things. So I was glad that he did it there so that I knew my polar bear was safe. So <laughs> yeah, the, the whole Northwest corner of that uh, cemetery along Engelman on the West end was um, the, uh, continually always uh, flooding in the spring in particular. And so they put uh, some uh, dry wells in there, added uh, 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 drain tile, some pumps and uh, brought in tons of dirt and uh, re-erected a whole bunch of uh, monuments that have been either fallen or, or uh, fallen or, or sunk below grade. So it, uh, it was a massive project done with volunteer labor mostly and uh, uh, a lot of donated materials and, uh, and uh, contributions. So that, that so group did a great you, job. Do you know Jerry Malberg who yeah. was, oh, very good. Okay, mm -hmm. wow, yep. see? How interesting. <laughs> and for all of our genealogy buffs, you know, you're still gonna find a, a a gravestone there so that's that's the good thing so i could put a plug in though i'm also on uh, the centerline uh, historical commission we call ourselves the historical society of centerline so we do have a, a small active group uh, we've been uh, in existence now for about four years so we're trying to get as much as we can uh, out of attics and old photo albums and uh, stories and you name it so we're on the, we're on the lookout for anybody that has uh, a part of uh, centerline's history that they'd like to share with us you know, that's how I feel about Mount Clemens. I feel like I'm on a treadmill. I got to grab everything I can because people are dying around me. You know, it's like I've lost several friends uh, to COVID and, and, you know, where did their stuff go? There was a Mr. Spire here who ended up, you know, oh my goodness, how much stuff did he have? So uh, there's just a lot that you want to make sure gets into museums and, and gets photographed and that we get, you know, interviews of some people who have good information about our past. So very good for you. Congratulations. And I, I wish you, you luck in that. That's Thank great. Yep. Any other comments? Uh, uh, Beverly. Go ahead. Mary. It, it's Mary Burkhardt. Hi, your, Mary long Burkhardt. Lost, your long lost friend, Beverly, was uh, one of my uh, longest uh, pharmacist friends when I met her when she was expecting baby number one at Rite Aid at 16 in Grossbeck in the 70s, right? We've been we go I know, back that Mary. far. And you always say Mount Clemens is the center of the universe. And I it believe is. you. 
<laughs> yes, uh, I worked at Mount Clemens General and my mother worked at St. Joe's. So it was, you know, my mom worked there for 46 years. I was going to just mention, though, about some of these military military histories are so easy to get through ancestry. Uh, I'm shocked. I mean, I worked for the Department of Veterans Affairs. It's almost easier to go on ancestry to get half the information than to go from the inside. Because uh, our mutual friend, Peter Riley, yes. who was the pharmacy chief at the Detroit VA, he's in my family circle. His son is married to my boyfriend's daughter, and we were at uh, Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving or Easter. And Arlene, who's also a pharmacist, said, that, that ancestry, I, I have two uncles. They both went, they were twins. They both went into World War II and only one came back. And she goes, I never knew what happened to my other uncle from West Virginia. I punched their names in before dinner was over. I had their military records and she had tried for years. So it's really wonderful resource. You know, I'm very interested in the women's military records. I know of a person from Roseville who served in World War I as a nurse and she left her husband and small baby to go to France and be a part of this because everybody was so into it, you know? And, and she tried to get paid for being a nurse and I don't think she ever got any. Now, I think eventually they were told they would get paid and got some retro pay, but it would be great if we could find the women's history. Right, and I think Harper Hospital had uh, various groups that they sent each, you know, big health system sent groups there, you know, yes. so it was kind of fascinating. So anyway, really nice job. And uh, now that I know I'm a Rivard, I'll be looking for that. <laughs> Who knew? I didn't realize I was one of the Rivard family. Oh, that's so. deep roots in Mount Clemens. Deep roots, the Rivards. Oh my goodness. It's so deep. Rivard, Rivard Street in Detroit, the pharmacy school. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Rivard Ribbon Farm. Yep. So anyway, thank you for doing this and for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for seeing hearing you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Like have my girl a again. I'm a Rivard, so got some <laughs> in my family tree too. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm from Jean Baptiste, the, the original and Catherine Yaks, the original settlers to Michigan, the Rivard first ones. So I'm sure we're on each other's tree. I'll look. <laughs> Petri, P-I-T-R-E, Peters. They were married into the Rivards. So yeah, yeah, there's there's a connection there. Thank you. Miss Luann. <laughs> Luann's usually got a connection to someone here. All right. Does anyone else have a question for uh Bev? Okay. Bev, I just have a quick comment. This is Jane. And thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I, I'm still working, I'm, I'm a middle school for people that don't know me. I'm Bev's sister-in-law. I'm married to her, one of her younger brothers, Ronald. And we live in North Carolina where my family originated. Um, and I, I thought when we moved down here 30, over 30 years ago, I would have lots of time for genealogical research. Since I, however, um, I work full time and somehow uh, in renovating a hundred year old house and having lots of animals and other things going on. I'm, I'm not having a lot of time to do research, um, but I do teach at a middle school. I'm a school librarian and I love teaching history and getting kids excited. Um, but thank you for this. This is, this is um, revitalized my interest in genealogy and, and maybe this summer I'll get a chance to do some cemetery walking and, and uh, get some more family history taken care of. But thank you again, and it was very, very enjoyable. Sounds good, Jane. Tell my brother I say hello, and it was his family I talked about, the Reichenbachs. And if he doesn't have some of those German traits, I don't know who does. Let me All right, you. thanks. Thank you, Beth. Okay, we've got one, one new comment in the chat, and it's from Diane Rice. I have a letter from Orson Barber, who was a polar bear, and I have a letter from Orson to my paternal grandmother on December 12, 1918. He was stationed at Archangel, uh, Russia. Oh, oh, well, I would love to see that letter. How can I? <laughs> um, I will get you each other's emails. Perfect, perfect. Okay. Great. All right. 
I remember Diane Rice from being at the library and she's done so much of Clinton um, Grove Cemetery's pictures there. Am I right? Are you there, Diane? Mute. There, there you I go. am. Okay. Um, no, I, it was Gail Schulte that did the Clinton Grove. <clears throat> I have gone over and, then, and taken some pictures. Um, I've done a lot of indexing is right -o, right what I'm doing for the Genealogy Society. Anyhow. Uh, the letter is very interesting, and he talks about being there. Hard frozen makes it hard walking. Glad to see the war with Germany is over. I suppose the boys will be home from France. Um, not falling in love with much of this country. Uh, I'm pretty well. Remain ever your loving brother Orson from Company H, 339 Infantry. And then it has A N R E F. Yes. I don't yes. know what that means. Uh, the that A N is the American North Russian Expeditionary Force. So that's what they were dubbed by Woodrow Wilson himself. He called them uh, that. He said, "Yeah, we'll send over five thousand guys. Take care of those Bolsheviks." Right. <laughs> and no business being there. That's what a lot of people have said over the years, you know, um, and, you know, I just got to say, you got to support, you know, your fellow army people. These poor guys had no idea. They did not know yeah. until almost the last second that they were going to the Arctic Circle, you know, right. and, uh, and they, they were, there was a lot of mistakes, I think, along the way during that. But World War Absolutely. I is so ugly. People don't even want to talk much about it. You know, it just has such a, a sadness about it. So much death. And uh, don't you think it was kind of buried? Yeah. How, how do you mean? I mean, the whole history of it was kind of buried so that we didn't let the, the United States people know, I mean, everybody in the United States, that we were in Russia fighting a Russian war, <laughs> civil right. war, instead of um, bringing our troops home. Yeah, and I would bet you it didn't make it into very many history books, but my, yes. uh, my sister-in-law, Jane, that was just here, she actually found it, and she's a librarian, so she found it in some of her history books, and we got a one line, there were polar bears. <laughs> I mean, you know, like, that's it. So- yeah, um, What does that mean? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we would know, but but they would not. But if I could get a copy of that letter, like if you could take a picture with your phone and then email it to me, I, I would love to put it in my presentation. I've done this presentation probably four other times to different small groups. And, um, you know, it's just fun. It's something very uh, unique. And, and it's I'd like to get as personal as possible. But like okay. I said, my guy died in 10 years, less than 10 years. And I think it was TB and he didn't, None of his stuff got saved. Unfortunately, his wife died a year later of the same thing. So I probably think it was TV, you know, that it's uh, despicable yeah, like that. A lot of people. And so their or children got farmed off and who knows where the artifacts went. Where did his mm -hmm. uniform and all that go? So I would Orson went home to Central Lake, um, which is up near Torch Lake, and uh, married and he lived till 1963. So how is he related to you? He's my great uncle, oh. my grandmother's brother. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. How interesting. Yes, and I didn't know because, anything about it till a cousin of mine told me about, um, about him being in, in, a, a polar bear. Oh. I mean, I had him in the genealogy, but I had no idea. <laughs> I had his tombstone, but it didn't mean anything to me that he was in the Michigan... 339. What do you mean you had his tombstone? I had a picture of his tombstone from Southern Cemetery. Oh, okay. I'd visited his grave. Wow. And his family, but um, no idea about this boulder bear business. Well, go out on the Bentley at U of M and they have a listing of the polar bear's names and make sure his name is on it. I mean, okay. he deserves his due. That's that's kind of how yes. I feel about it, you know, so other people can find him too. And if you have right. that letter, you might upload it to them too. And of course, everything they've been saving at the Heroes Museum in Frankenmuth, I mean, uh, Mike Robel can talk more about that, but I, I took up some pictures and they were glad to get them. They'd like originals if they can get them and, 
And they're such a good repository of all that stuff. So the problem with this letter is it's been translated and typed up. It isn't as in, in his original hand. Oh, who has the original? I can write to my cousin that she put it together. Her mother, my aunt, lived to be 102. And for her 100th birthday, she put together a nice booklet of her life. And she put in a whole page about um, about the American intervention in Northern Russia and about the polar bear in this letter. Wow, that's very cool. All of it is very cool. Because I, I don't think I it was originally typed. <laughs> ah. Well, you know, there are new books coming out about the polar bears. There's a very old one that is might go to reprint. And then there's a whole series of other books and their stories. And um, who knows, someone might be researching that and, and want to get a hold of that too. So making it available uh, on genealogy sources, even on Ancestry, if you were to copy it and put it out on there, people can find it, you know? I do okay. have it. My, I Mike do have it here, there. can I make a suggestion? Uh, Ancestry has a subsidiary called Fold3.com, uh, yes. which is mostly military records. Yes, One aware. section on that is an, uh, a, a memorial section where you can type in uh, a veteran's name or and uh, find out whatever records they may have on it. There may already be a page there that they created uh, automatically based on a fragment of a record that they have on that particular soldier, sailor, you name it. And you'd be surprised how many uh, men have something in a record there uh, that you can start with. And if you can't find them in there, you can create one and you can do this free. You don't have to subscribe. You have to create a free account, but you can populate uh, that particular veteran's um, record on the honor wall with photos, records, pictures, whatever you want, and tell stories. Uh, you can write the stories and put them in there uh, just through a, a Word document. So if you've got that uh, letter transcribed, that could be a good place. And uh, you could title it that uh, he was a polar bear with the 339th and uh, tell his story there. And uh, it would be uh, probably a better place to put it than in Ancestry because people would be looking for military stuff at full three more so that, than at Ancestry. So that's, that's what I do. Whenever I get an inquiry and uh, somebody's at looking for records, the first thing I do is I go to Ancestry and look for the troop transport uh, records. Any of the soldiers that went overseas in World War II, uh, you'll find their uh, passenger list information along with next to kin, rank, serial number. That's about it. But because of the fire, that's about all you got for most of these guys in the Army. But it's a good starting point. I get that. I put it up on the memorial page for that particular veteran so they can see that and add in any other information I might be able to find for them. So that's where I would suggest to do it. That's a good idea. I have the U.S. Transport Service arriving and departing list, passenger yep. list. That's it. That's it. I have it. It came up through Ancestry. Yep. And I have his draft card as well for World War II. No, World War One and Two. Anyhow. All right. Is That's my story. Any other questions? If not, I'll make a couple other announcements I just thought of. Okay. Um, Ancestry Library Edition, if you've hopefully seen our uh, blog website, has been free remote, temporary free remote access has been extended till the end of June. So you have more time to play for free. Manually add it to your uh, genealogy programs. And also for any of you that are Macomb County residents and you're, you're in the uh, range of eligibility to get a vaccine shot and maybe you haven't got one because of two, Tuesdays the phone or the website didn't work out for you, they're actually keeping it up as long as they have appointments available that new appointment button is still active so you can give it a shot. I'm looking at it right now and it's still there. Um, so good luck. I get mine on Friday. Lisa, uh -huh. there also is contact through SMART. Yes. Okay, if people don't know that yes. and, and you don't have to be 
a consumer of smart services. Yeah, they're using the two other sites for those, but yeah. Okay. So there's a out some alternate ways to try to get your appointments. Mm -hmm. And it's through the county free. You don't need your insurance card or anything like that just your license and or ID and you're good to go. Thank you for watching. Our next meeting's April 14th. And we're going back to a Let's Talk genealogy discussion format and our favorite topic, where do I go from here? And of course, we thank the Mount Clemens Public Library and its staff for hosting this Zoom meeting.